when I was four, one of the things that we had to do is I had to go to uh, the other Middletown, Indiana, to the old high school gymnasium, and I had to go through a kindergarten pre-screening. And I don't, I don't remember honestly much other than the fact that we got a bag of candy when it was all over and said and done, except that after it, my mom had to make a phone call. Because in that screening, they had determined that my eyesight was not that good. So I got to go to what I thought at that time was the big town of Newcastle. Now remember, I'm a hillbilly boy living out on a one-acre track of land. Newcastle was the big town. And I got to meet a guy who I wasn't really sure who or what he was, because he looked different than me and he talked different than me, but he was my optometrist, Dr. Salas. And I still don't know where from South America he was from. But what he did was to make sure that I could see better, he did for the first time, what's happened multiple times. And those of you who have 20-20 vision, congratulations that you may have only experienced this once or never. But he put the big honking thingy majiggy, and I think that's the official name of it in optometry circles, the big honking thingy majiggy, down on my eyes, and in his Spanish English said, is it better like dis or like dis? And I was like, I don't know what dis is. Now, but he started this process of trying to get my eyes to focus in such a way it would be better. And the, the fun part of that is, is the first time they put new lenses in front of your eyes, you know what almost all automatically happens? It looks better. You're like, what? just stop. Let's just stop right here. This makes sense. But as you go through the 1 and 2 and A and B and left and right and whatever things they come up with, you start to realize that they're trying to make sure you see most clearly, not just clearly. If we're going to live out the freedom that we were promised in the first half of Galatians, we've got to figure out how to focus in such a way that we can follow God into that freedom. And I think Paul takes us to, through an optical exam. He gives us two different frameworks by which our eyes might be a little better. Turn with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5 this morning. We're in verse 16. As we get to verse 16, we see the first, we see the first way we could focus. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. First we have this focus which begins with the flesh, but what dictates the flesh? Paul said if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Guess what your flesh is really producing? Your flesh produces the works of the law. So the first thing we can do is we can have a focus of regulation. We can have a focus of regulation. And that makes sense. If I only understand God as God the ruler... The God who is the lawgiver, who gives us the do's and the do nots, and that's my goal, then here's what I'll read. I will read the Bible and it will come across things that tell me not to do and tell me things to do. And if I'm going to get back into relationship with God, then what am I going to attempt? I'm going to attempt with my own strength and my own power to follow all the rules. Because that's how the story started. What was the first rule? With a negative. Do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There it is. There's law. And what happened 12 verses later? They ate from the tree of the fruit, uh, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened? Well, God showed up. 
And when God showed up because we did what we weren't supposed to do, we now understand in God's holiness we cannot stand. So the folks did what? They hid themselves from God. There's a break in the relationship. And God comes along and gives promises of grace. He gives clothing where we've only picked out fig leaves. And then he says, you know what? If they continue to live like this, we've got a problem. Because if they continue to eat from the tree of eternal life while being separated, they'll be eternally separated. And then there's this verse in Genesis chapter 3. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And from that point, humanity began to come up with a wonderful concept. Well, if we got kicked out of the garden because we broke the rules, maybe if we keep all the rules, guess what? God will let us come back in. But the problem is, is the longer we're gone from the garden, guess what we start to forget about? Not only the garden, but the God we found in the garden. So pagans, who have no message from God, begin to worry about who God is. And without the ability to know who God is, guess what they start doing? They start turning anything and everything they can worship into a god, hoping to please it. If thunder hits my house, thunder must be God. So I will build a shrine to the god of thunder, and I will offer sacrifices, and I will create a system to please the god of thunder. And so it goes. And suddenly you have pagans who are worshiping anything and everything under the sun, but it's not God. And they've begun then to create their own God, and in a way they're cre they've created themselves as God. Let me ask you a question. Did that make life any better for anybody? I'm sure that nowhere will we go back and read about temple worship where any of these things happened that Paul says you can't do. You'll never read about sexual immorality. Well, no, you'll read about that in temples. You'll never read about impurity and demo... Well, you'll read about that, especially in the Greek and Roman temples. Idolatry, witchcraft, which is the use of drugs. I'm, I, well, yeah, you'll read about that. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Uh, you know, well, you know what? On second thought, let's forget that idea. It, it didn't work. But you know what? There's a second group of people out there. And this is the second group that makes up the Galatian church. They're Jewish people. And they didn't lose the voice of God because of what reason? God revealed himself to them through 39 books and told them all about himself. And he gave them not just an idea of coming up with law, he gave them specific laws. And you know what that meant? Israel was a blessed nation where everybody did what was right. And no one ever did any of these things. No siree Bob. There was never a sexually immoral man, well, except David, the man after God's own heart. There was no ever idolatry, except for the fact that when they become a nation, there's a constant problem with the fact that there are people worshiping other gods in the high places. Uh, you know what? <sighs> Maybe we got a problem getting back to God through regulation after all. So what do we do with the laws of God? What do we do with the fact that even in pagans, there's a desire for somebody to tell us what to do and try to please this lawgiver, whether it be a rock or whether it even be the God we don't know? What does that all mean? Can we just kick all the laws out and just pretend they don't exist and hope that'll solve all the problems? And if that's what you think I've said in this series, we need to address that. No. That's called antinomianism. It's a term that Martin Luther phrased or coined in the 16th century. It means no law. And he says you can't go that route. You can't remove the law of God from the picture. But the problem is what we've missed is what Paul says about the law of God. 